we now begin our investigation of gears. I show here an animation of two metric gears that are brought together and transfer torque from one axis to another. When we bring two gears together, we need to make sure that the teeth on one gear can mesh with the teeth on the other gear. They have to mesh so that they don't collide with the bottom land of a neighboring gear, and so that as one tooth is moving out of meshing, it doesn't scrape the neighboring tooth. And so there are specific requirements on the dimensions of teeth. We also need to understand how we're going to represent these gears so that we can calculate the speed ratios and the torque transfer. We need to design the depth of these gears so that we can handle the contact stresses that are going to occur when teeth mesh and the bending stresses that are going to occur when teeth mesh. And we have to turn all of that into a fatigue calculation so that the gear teeth can not only handle the applied torques, but can handle them for a specified lifetime. We will get into more of the details of gear teeth shortly, but first we'll just start with the basics of a number of different types of gears. I show here a figure from the Shigley textbook where we have two parallel axes and we have a small gear on the left here, which is rotating counterclockwise. We call that one the pinion. And then we have the gear over here on the right. It will be rotating clockwise. Now these are spur gears because they have straight cut teeth and the teeth on the gear are cut parallel to the axis of rotation. If we move to helical gears, we notice that the helical gear teeth are cut at an angle with respect to the axis of rotation and that angle is shown over here on the right. It is the helix angle psi. You'll notice in order for these gear teeth to mesh that both teeth are cut at the angle psi, but on the left gear, you'll notice that they are inclined differently than they are on the right gear. Now, what's interesting about these different gear types is that helical gears will not only transmit torque, but they will also generate axial loads along the axis of rotation. This figure shows a bevel gear, which is transmitting rotational power between two perpendicular axes as shown here. The smaller one again is referred to as pinion. These teeth have to be cut at very interesting angles along a cone. The apex intersects for each of these gears at the intersection of the two axes of rotation. Now that doesn't always have to happen. You can do very interesting things with bevel gears, but bevel gears are used to transmit rotational power between non-parallel axes. The gear ratio has to do with the size of the two gears that are meshing with each other, and that size ratio determines the speed difference between the two gears and the torque difference. So you can accentuate torque and reduce speed, or you can increase speed and reduce torque. The rule of thumb for gearboxes is you never exceed a 10 to 1 gear ratio on a single stage. Now the important thing about all of these gears is that they are designed so that the teeth roll across each other and that rolling contact reduces the friction and so this is a very efficient torque transmission. If we want to go to much higher gear ratios than 10 to 1, we use worm gears. And in a worm gear you will notice that the axis of the worm is perpendicular to the axis of the gear and so we rotate the worm, which has a spiral cut on it, it meshes with the worm gear and rotates the gear depending upon the angle of the cut of the worm and the axial rotation of the worm. But when you go to worm gears, they have very high friction because there's a lot of sliding that occurs between the teeth, which is completely different from the spur, helical, and bevel gears that we talked about a moment ago. Now we want to talk a little bit about the terminology of gears. And so I'm I'm going to zoom in on a picture on a section of some gear teeth and we identify a number of key traits of these gears. The first is the top of the gear is called the top land and 
the bottom of it is called the bottom land. The gear teeth will interact with a neighboring set of gear teeth across the face of the gear tooth, and that gear tooth face is everywhere above what's called the pitch circle. We will get to that in a minute. The pitch circle is a representative diameter that we use to help us do calculations on speed and torque ratios. The tooth thickness is always measured across a segment that is on the pitch circle. The bottom side of the tooth where it reaches the bottom land is always cut with a fillet radius to reduce the stress concentration factor associated with bending of the teeth. Now when you have the two gears in mesh, a load will be transmitted from one gear to the other through a normal force on on the face of the gear tooth. The face width is the depth we would choose of the gear itself. As we increase the face width, we increase the cross-sectional area of the gear tooth. And for the same load transfer, you're going to be decreasing the stresses. The distance below the pitch circle to the bottom land is called the dedendum. The distance from the pitch circle to the top land is called the addendum. And all of these dimensions, addendum, dedendum, tooth thickness, and another dimension here called circular pitch, which is a measure along the pitch circle between two identical locations on immediately adjacent teeth. So we take the back side of this tooth on the right to the back side of its neighboring tooth again on its flank. Now we have to define a number of important terms and it is very important that when we bring gears together, we are representing them by their pitch circles. So if we had a pinion, the smaller gear shown here, interacting with a gear that is of greater diameter shown here to the left, and if that pinion was rotating counterclockwise, as shown here, then the gear will be rotating clockwise. We transmit that rotation through a force that is acting here at the pitch point. The pitch point is the place where the two gear circles kiss each other. Now we need to know the radius of each of these gears, so the radius of the pinion and the radius of the gear, but usually we are simply talking in terms of diameters, and so we need to know the the pinion diameter and the gear diameter represented by these symbols DP and DG. I already alluded to the fact that gears are made according to standards and there are two different types of teeth. There are the full depth tooth systems and stub teeth. You can imagine that all that means is the stub teeth are shorter than the full depth teeth. And there is a pressure angle associated with that gear. The angle of interaction of the force that is transmitted between two teeth is called the pressure angle. There are a number of standard pressure angles from 20 to 22 and a half to 25. The addendum distances are generally equal to the module. We'll get to that in a moment and the dedendum follow a standard approach as well. So the dedendum is always greater than the addendum because we want to make sure that the top land of one tooth does not crash into the bottom land of the gear it is meshed with. So we're going to introduce this whole notion of a diametral pitch now. And the diametral pitch in the English system is the number of teeth on a gear divided by the pitch diameter. And the pitch diameter, as I mentioned, is the diameter of the circle that we use to represent the gear. So in the English system, again, we call the diametral pitch the number of teeth divided by the diameter of the pitch circle. And so it is given as teeth per inch in the English system. In the metric system, it is called the module rather than diametral pitch, and it is just the pitch circle diameter divided by the number of teeth on the gear. And the important key fact that you have to take away here is if you're going to bring two gears together and transmit rotary power from one gear to the other, they must have the same diametral pitch or the same module. You cannot get them to work with each other if they don't have the same diametral pitch 
or module. The other thing that is true is we have to introduce what is called the circular pitch, and I might have referred to it already. Remember that circular pitch was a measure that you take along the pitch circle from one tooth to the exact location on an adjacent tooth. That is called the circular pitch. And the face width of a gear, so how deep the gear is, is generally kept between three and five times the circular pitch. So the circular pitch, let's use little p, it is going to be equal to the distance between identical locations on adjacent teeth. The circumference is going to be pi times the pitch diameter. If we divide that by the number of teeth, that gives us the circular pitch. Well, we have already said for the English system that the diametral pitch is equal to the number of teeth per inch. So it's just the number of teeth divided by the pitch diameter. So the circular pitch is just going to be equal to pi over the diametral pitch. In the metric system, we said that the module M is equal to D over N. So in the metric system, the circular pitch is going to be equal to M, the module, times pi. And those are two kind of important relationships because we end up using them. As mentioned, you build gears according to standards. You choose face widths that depend upon the circular or diametral pitches, and you construct the teeth to have a very specific geometry which supports what's called conjugate action. And the conjugate action maintains the same speed ratio throughout the engagement of the teeth. And the only way you can do that is by making the teeth involute profiles, and we will talk about that now. You make an involute profile by identifying what is called a base circle, which is smaller than the pitch circle. And what you imagine is that you roll a piece of string along the base circle, and then you attach a pencil, say to one point on that string. You keep the string tight, and then you pull that string away from the base circle, and it sketches a curve and that curve is an involute profile. It is totally important to the way gear teeth function. So the involute profiles assure a constant speed ratio. Even if you slightly change the distance between the centers of two adjacent gears, as long as they contact along the involute profile, you will maintain the same speed ratio that you designed it to have. So let's talk a little bit about those ratios now. So if we have a pinion shown here on the left and a gear shown here on the right, and that pinion has a pitch diameter dp and the gear has a pitch diameter dg, then at the pitch point, which is where the two pitch circles just touch each other. So at the pitch point, the velocity has to be the same. So if the pinion is spinning at W1 and the gear is spinning at W2, we know that W1 times the pinion diameter divided by 2 is going to be the speed at the pitch point. That has got to be equal to W2 times its pitch circle radius. So that W2 is going to be equal to dp over dg times w1. And so it's clear that w2, since the pitch diameter of the pinion is smaller than that of the gear, w2 will be less than w1. But you want to make sure that throughout the entire interaction of the gear teeth, that that speed ratio stays the same. So you draw these you draw these involute profiles on the base circle, and the base circle, as shown here, sits inside the pitch circle, which is in this dashed line here. And now the way to imagine this guaranteed speed ratio is we take this string that we have wrapped around the base circle, we let it run over and onto the base circle of the gear. So the pinion is up here, the gear is down below it. The pinion is at O1, the gear is at O2, and that string stays tight, and it stays tight because the velocity with which it departs from 
gear one is equal to the velocity it is taken up on gear two. And the other important thing is we use these strings to cut gear teeth as involute profiles, and we did it on each gear. We unwrapped a string from each gear to create these involute profiles. And the forced transmission, if gear one is driving gear two, the forced transmission follows the line from A to B and is always inclined at what is called the pressure angle. Now you see what it is. It's inclined at the pressure angle, which has to do with this line of action being perpendicular to a radius of the base circle on gear one and perpendicular to a radius of the base circle on gear two. So that line of action is the line of action of the tooth force that occurs throughout tooth engagement.